The Sermon on the Mount was delivered by Jesus on a sloping hillside just north of the Sea of Galilee. You could see the beautiful flowers of the grass and the, the nature all around. Uh, you could see the Sea of Galilee off in the distance. It's a beautiful, special place. But even more beautiful than the surroundings were the words that Jesus the Messiah gave to a group that made up his disciples and a broader group than just the 12, uh, maybe 100, maybe 200 people who had an interest in being his disciples. This is what he said. And I'm going to read our entire text here, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. On Sundays, we're making our way through the Sermon on the Mount, and so we're kind of carving it up into sections, a few verses at a time. And I think that's the right way for us to go through the Sermon on the Mount, but there's some weaknesses in that. We, we can have a tendency to see each one of these sections as kind of disconnected from the other sections. But there's a wonderful train of thought that flows through the entire Sermon on the Mount. And, and we can pick up the train of thought from the beginning to where we are right now. Jesus began trying to explain to his disciples and to those who could potentially be his disciples, he explained to them, this is what it's like to be my follower. This is what it's like to be a citizen of my kingdom. And so first he describes kind of the character of those kingdom citizens in what we call the Beatitudes. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And he's explaining to them, these are kind of the character qualities of those who are in my kingdom. But, but at the end of that section, Jesus explained that the people who have those character qualities, the people who are committed to being citizens of his kingdom, those very people will often be persecuted by a hostile world. And that's what we took a look at last Sunday, where Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted, and that we should rejoice when we're persecuted that way. Where we might expect that those people would receive applause from the world, oftentimes they don't. Oftentimes the world rejects them and persecutes them. Now, when we are persecuted, there's a tendency to withdraw within a protective shell. I mean, this totally makes sense. When an attack comes, you have the natural response of either fight or flight. You want to battle back or you just want to get out of there. There's, there's a shell you want to go into defensively. And Jesus says to us as his followers, no, 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 I'm not going to allow that. What you have to do is you have to be salt and light in the world. My role for you is not to retreat, but to engage. Even though we have this temptation when times are tough and we feel persecuted by the outside world, there's this temptation to withdraw into our own little Christian communities and cliques. Jesus said, no, the citizens of my kingdom have an important role to play in this world, even in a world that persecutes them. They are like salt and light in this world. Now, there's a big message for us right there. It reminds us that our discipleship as followers of Jesus Christ, it is not just for our benefit. P part of the reason why God wants to work in your life and wants you to be his follower is so that you can do good for others. It it's not just all about you. But God puts you and I, those of us who want to be his followers, he puts us in this world so that we can be a blessing and do good for this very world to be salt and light within this world. It's not just about us. It's not just about our own personal benefit. In your heart or in your actions, you may want to write off a world that you perceive as going to hell and doesn't like you very much. But that's not what Jesus told his disciples to do. He said, you can't write off the world. Get out there and be salt and light. That's what he told us to do. So let's take a look at this in two parts. First of all, the part where Jesus talked about being salt, that's in verse 13. Verse 13 together. You are the salt of the earth, 
But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. The first illustration that Jesus uses of our connection with the world, our engagement with the world, is that we are to be salt. Now, what what was the idea of salt, especially in the thinking of the ancient world? Well, first of all, salt was a very valuable commodity in the ancient world. It was like money. We have records that at some times and in some places, Roman soldiers might receive their pay in salt. Can you imagine that? You you go to the pay table to get your wages for the week, and they give you a little pouch of salt. That's how valuable and how sellable salt was in the ancient world. We get our phrase that nobody uses much anymore, but some of you may remember it, to say somebody is worth their salt. That's kind of the idea and where it comes from. It was precious, and Jesus is saying to his thoughts, you're like salt in the earth, you're precious in the world. But that's not all, or maybe not even the primary meaning. One of the primary meanings behind it is the idea that Christians are to serve as a preserving influence in the world. When you and I think of salt, we mainly think of it as something that we use to season our food. You put salt on it. And some of you, you love your salt on everything. Right? Some of you, some of you, you salt your food even before you taste it. You don't even have to t- I want salt on this. And too much salt is almost incomprehensible. You just like that flavor. Because salt, especially when it's used well, when it's used properly, it greatly enhances the flavor of food. It's something is that's how we use it. But in the ancient world, yes, salt was used to flavor food. But probably more importantly, salt was used to preserve meats. You know, salted meats that we like, that originally came out of necessity because in a day before they had refrigeration and sophisticated systems to preserve meat, a very basic way that you could do it is pack it with salt and it would help preserve the meat. The idea behind salt is very much of a preserving influence. And that's what Jesus says about his people. You are to be like a preservative in the world. If the world around you is going to hell, the presence of believers, of disciples in its midst should make it slow down in its progress to hell. It should make the world better, not worse, that Christians are there among it. That's Jesus' simple thinking there. Precious, but then also a preservative. But we also can't get away from the idea that it's a flavoring. It's just supposed to make the society better. The world is supposed to be better for the fact that Christians are in it. Now, look, sometimes the world doesn't even understand that because as we just saw last week, the world often persecutes believers, does it not? Well, why would the world persecute those who make the world better? I don't know, the world is confused on this point, but it's often the case. I heard a great story right along these lines from a friend of mine who's the pastor of a church at Calvary Chapel in Tel Aviv, Israel. And if you're a pastor of a Calvary Chapel or of a church there in Tel Aviv, Israel, one thing you got to deal with is Orthodox Jews in your community. And this particular church was located right next to an Orthodox Jewish school or seminary or something like that, a place where there were a lot of Orthodox Jews all the time. And this man told me about a unique experience he had with the rabbi among those Orthodox Jews. The rabbi came to him one day and he said, I want to hate you. I want to wish you were gone. But he said, I can't. He said, well, why? He said, because I see all the good you do in your community through your soup kitchen, through your help for the poor, through your love for drug addicts, for the way that you practically help people. I see all the good you do and I can't hate you. (laughs) He wanted to not like him, but he looked and goes, look at all the good they're doing. And isn't that just a very practical way that here he is adding good flavor to the community? And friends, it should be the same for us. Christians should be a blessing wherever they go. It should be a good thing that there's Christians in the community of Santa Barbara. It should, and I hope we're fulfilling this, at least in the little way that God gives us to it, it should be good for the schools in our community that there are Christians in our community. So what do we do? We partner up with Franklin Elementary School. And we help them out with things that they ask help for. And we try to just serve them and bless them in the name of Jesus. We want them to be grateful that there's Christians in this community. 
It should be good for the rescue mission. It should be good for other social agencies. They should look around and say, this is good for, this is like salt on food, making it taste better. This is something good. Now, it makes me pause and want to say, let's be real about this. There are times when people experience bad things from Christians in a community. Sometimes individually, sometimes corporately. And all I can say about that is, I'm sorry. In that respect, whatever believers are making the community worse and not better, they're not living up to the standard that Jesus pointed out for, for his disciples. It's not good. We we as believers should do better. But this is what God has given us to do, to be like salt that goes out in a precious way, in a preserving way, and in a flavoring way in our very community. Okay, that's not the only illustration Jesus gives. Starting at verse 14, now he's going to talk about how his disciples should be like light. Do you see that? Look at verse 14. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, after saying that believers are like salt on the earth, then Jesus says that believers should be like the light of the world. And you got to admit, this is a great compliment and then also a great responsibility. Because I find nowhere recorded in the scriptures where Jesus himself claimed to be the salt of the earth. But there's at least two places in the Gospel of John where Jesus claimed and said, I am the light of the world. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said of himself, I am the light of the world. And now he looks at his followers and he says, you are the light of the world. Just like I shined in the world, it's as if Jesus says to us, just like I shined in the world, now I want you to shine in the world. And by the way, that is a powerful declaration of the individual worth and mission of every believer. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You, individually you. I find this fascinating, especially Because of the Jews of that time, there were certain prominent rabbis whom they referred to as being the light of the world. You know, Rabbi so-and-so, he is the light of the world. Uh, Rabbi this and that, he is the light of the world. But you see what Jesus does? He looks at all of us, he looks at those 12 disciples of his, sometimes as goofy and messed up as they were. He looked at uh, hundreds of people who also wanted to be his disciples in some way. Whatever goofiness and messed upness they had. He looks at them all and says, you guys, you, you're the light of the world. We just say, wow, what a responsibility. What a blessing he gives to us. In other words, there's not another light that Jesus is shining. Are you waiting for an angel to come down from heaven and shine the light? Jesus says, no, it's not going to happen. Are you waiting for God to do it apart from his people? Well, I suppose he might, but rarely does it happen that way. No, what does God say? He says, I want to do this work in and through my people. They will be like my body, my hands and my feet on this earth. They will be the light of the world. Now, it's also a great indication of the present state and responsibility of the believer where he says, you are are the light of the world. Jesus never challenged us to become light or salt for that matter. He simply said that we are. You either fulfill that responsibility or you don't. You are the light of the world. Not I hope you become it, but that's what you are. You're you're either a bad light or a good light, but you're a light one way or the other. But then notice this, it's also a declaration of a goal, of a standard to live up to. You are the light of the world. It doesn't do much good if the light doesn't shine. I I think about it, what it must have been like for Jesus. Because in his day, they didn't have artificial lighting the way we do today. I mean, you look around, you see all different kinds of light. We have all different ways to provide light and do things with light that are pretty cool in our modern age that we just take for granted. You you know what they had in Jesus' day? Pretty much for artificial light, they had oil lamps. Now, they might be bigger than this little one that I had, but it's the same principle. You pour some oil in the middle of it. There's a little flame with a wick that goes up, and it provides a little bit of light. 
And, and this is the kind of light that Jesus was talking about. You're the light of the world. Now, individually, one of these might not be too bright. But if you could just imagine putting a hundred of them in a room, well, that might light it up pretty good. But Jesus says this, Jesus didn't think about the other things that you could do with light. I, I wonder if he was preaching it today, if he might change it up. He would say, don't be a strobe light flashing on and off all the time. He, he might say, don't be a dimmer switch Christian where you can just adapt yourself bright or dark according to your surroundings. I, I mean, you think Jesus could do all different things with the modern technology, but for us, he just says, you're the light of the world. It's simple and steady. You don't have to be spectacular. You don't have to be a laser light show with one of these. You can just be the light of the world and shine in a very simple and steady way that will bring God glory. Now, I find that in the rest of the scriptures, there are several ways that the Bible uses this picture of light in a way that we can learn from. One of them is found in Ephesians chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul details how we are to be the light of the world, and he says it in his own way. So I just want us to walk through this passage of scripture. I'm going to put it up on the screen because we're, we're, uh, we're doing it in the New Living Translation just because I think it phrases it so well. So take a look at this. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 8 through 16 in the New Living Translation. He writes, For though your hearts were once full of darkness, now you are full of light from the Lord and your behavior should show it. Isn't that very much like Jesus saying you're the light of the world? V very similar idea. Okay, now next. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, rebuke and expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But when the light shines on them, it becomes clear how evil these things are. And where your light shines, it will expose evil deeds. This is why it is said, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live, not as fools, but as those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days. Isn't that remarkable how similar the, the track of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and, and the words of Paul in Ephesians 5 work together? This is speaking to us about how we're to live in this world. And we have a conscious mind towards doing good in this world, doing good as salt and doing good as light. Now, let me pause just for a moment and make something very plain. The Sermon on the Mount and the section Paul wrote in, in Ephesians chapter 5, this is not telling us how to get right with God. If you want to know how to get right with God, God isn't telling you, well, be saltier, then you'll be right with God. God isn't saying to you, uh, well, let your light shine brighter, and then you'll get right with God. No, no, no. What Paul and Jesus tells us in Ephesians 5 and in Matthew 5 respectively is how we are to live once we are made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. If you need to get right with God, the pathway for that is by repentance from your sins and trusting in the person and work of Jesus Christ, especially by what he did on the cross. So we can't confuse the two things. If we make the Sermon on the Mount the way to accomplish salvation, the way to make yourself right with God, we're going to run into all kinds of trouble. But what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount is, this is how the person who is made right with God looks. This is what's important to them. This is what they live their life after. And a big part of that is simply doing good in this world. To let your light so shine. That's what Jesus says in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. The whole purpose of a light is to shine. It has to be exposed if it's of any use. If it's hidden under a basket, it is of no value whatsoever. And sometimes we kind of cop to this as Christians. We kind of get in this mode. Oh no, listen, there is so much light within me. Tons, tons, tons. I'm just not shining it. 
then brother, where's the light? No, 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 I'm filled with it. It, it is just, it, I am a being of light. It, it's just, I don't feel like shining it right now. Jesus would say to you, brother or sister, he would say to you, what, let your light so shine before men. You can talk about how the light is in you, but you do not want to be a dimmer switch disciple, constantly adjusting your light to the surroundings. Instead, let your light shine before men. Now, he does say that, though. Let it shine before men. I I don't want to make too much about it, but he didn't say, shine it in their eyes. I wonder what Jesus would do if he had the metaphor of a 10,000 candle power flashlight. And isn't that how some of us want to do, like the great interrogators and other people? Oh, I'll let my light so shine, and you throw that beam right but in their eyes. No, before men, to illuminate their surroundings. The, the idea isn't, oh, I'm so filled with light and you're so dark, it, isn't it terrible? No, it's that my light gives light to your way and shows you the path of how to get right with God. No, he wants us to have that kind of visible presence. And in the same way, if you look at verse 14, he says, a city on, that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. He, he's drawn a third metaphor. The first one was salt. The second one was light. Now it's a city that's on a hill. And, and the idea is that this is a prominent city that can't be hidden. And if you see that kind of city from a distance, it's hard to take your eyes off of it. It's a guide to your way. And Jesus says, that's how my people are to be in the world. Now, some people say that within view of where Jesus spoke these very words, the Sermon on the Mount, you can see the highest city in the region of Galilee. It's a city called Safed, which is almost 3,000 feet high. And maybe Jesus even pointed into the direction of the city of Safed and see, there's a city on a hill. You can't take your eyes off of it. That's what I want you to be in this world. So following again in the same pattern nor, verse 15, do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it up on a lamp stand. Instead of trying to make the light or the city less visible, you want to make it more visible. You know, you take a little oil lamp like this, and if you want its light to spread in the room more, you put it up on a lamp stand. You don't put it down low. And so, in the ancient world, homes had lamp stands, just a little table, just a little rest where you could put a lamp and its light would go out into more of the room. Well, that's what Jesus wants us to do, is to lift up that light in a more prominent place. And notice what he says there in verse 15. He says, it gives light to all who are in the house. Please look at those words. I'm going to make an application from that, that I don't know if Jesus intended it, but it's suggestive to me. He said, when that light shines, the light that Jesus puts within us, he says, when that light shines, it gives light to all who are in the house. In other words, the first place where the light shines is in the house, in your house. It is true and tragic that there are more than a few people who live wonderful Christian lives out in the community or at the church, but not in their own home. The the people at their work hear them say, praise the Lord, and they hear them talk about God all the time. The the people at church see them lift up their hands. Lord, listen, those are good things. I'm not saying that's bad. The problem isn't what they're doing in the community or at church. The problem is what they're not doing at home. And if I can make an application from this statement of Jesus, it gives light to all who are in the house. The first place to let your light shine is in your home. And you and I know the problem with that, though. Isn't sometimes that the most difficult place to let your light shine? Sometimes it is much easier to be a Christian in the community than it is at home. Sometimes it's much easier, I hope, to be a Christian at church than it is to be at home. But Jesus said, and you and I know that this is so in the heart of God, that he wants our Christian light to shine first and foremost at home. 
Are, are you failing in that? Is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart right now about that? C- can I simply tell you that if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart about that right now, it is not to condemn you. It's not to make you walk out of here convinced what a miserable Christian and what a miserable person you are because you don't live it out at home. No, the purpose is not to condemn. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to draw you in humble surrender to God and for you to beg him so that you can rely on him for the power and strength to live as you should at home, not just out in the world. I have in my mind a picture. I I won't call it a vision, but I just call it a picture in my mind of a dad gathered with his family around a table tonight. And mom's there and the kids are there and the dad just humbly says to him, God spoke to me today and I understand that I haven't been what I should be in this home as far as really glorifying God and living for him. And I just want you to know that I'm sorry And God helping me, I'm going to do better. Now, if you heard your spouse or your parents say that at the table tonight, would you think less of them or more of them? Instantly, you would think, Lord, what an amazing work you're doing in my spouse or in my parent. We don't lose respect in our families when we do this. We gain it. So friends, I know, as a pastor, it's very rare that I know what's going on behind the walls of your home. But God knows. And God forbid that we would have Christian lives that look wonderful in the community or wonderful at church, and there's grievous problems at home that aren't being surrendered to the Lord. If there are such problems... We as a church family, as a church staff, we are here to help. Call us. We'll connect you with pastors. We'll connect you with people who will love you and help you. Maybe nothing more than just praying for you. But we are here to help you. Because if the light's going to shine, if the salt's going to be in the world, it has to begin at home. Why? Look at verse 16 that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The, the purpose of letting our light so shine and doing good works is so that other people would glorify God and not ourselves. The goal of our shining isn't to show everybody, look how shiny I am, but so that will, people will say, oh, what a Father in heaven these people must have. That's what we want them to say. You see, we want people to glorify God when they see our good works. It's not all about how wonderful we are. Because look, we're on the wonderful scale, we're a mixed bag, aren't we? But God is no mixed bag on the wonderful scale. He is all good, and we want people to see the goodness that happens in the lives of his people. And the power of this is demonstrating the fact that in the entire New Testament, this is the first time God is called Father. The very first time. When people see the good works of the children, they look to the Father in heaven and give him glory. All right, let me conclude just with a few final thoughts. Number one, a key thought in both of these pictures of salt and light is distinction. Salt is needed because the world is rotting. And if our Christianity is also rotting, it won't do any good And light is needed because the world is in darkness. And if our Christianity imitates the darkness of the world around us, then we have nothing to show the world. To be effective as salt and light in this world, we have to seek and display the Christian distinctive. We can never affect the world for Jesus by being just like the world. No, we we have to be distinctively Christian in that witness. Number two, I'm amazed when I see Jesus speak here at the breadth of the vision 
for impact upon the world that Jesus had. Think about what Jesus did. Jesus was on a hillside in a despised province in a corner of the Roman Empire, speaking to at the most a couple hundred people. At the most, it could have been less. And he looks at all those people and says, you, you're the light of the world. He didn't say you're the light of Galilee. He didn't say you're the light of the village you're in. He didn't say you're the light of of this Roman province. Jesus was so big to say light of the world. I, I imagine when Jesus said this, one person turning to another, he thinks pretty big, doesn't he? But it's true, isn't it? Christians are the light of the world. And I am so happy that the story of Christianity today is that believers are all over the world doing good in the name of Jesus. Don't let anybody tell you that Christians don't do good in the name of Jesus all over the world, that hospitals aren't founded, that poverty isn't relieved, that that miserable people aren't brought up, that, that, that justice isn't pursued. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we should do it more and more, and I know it's an endless amount of work to do, but I thank God that it's true that what Jesus said about believers being the light of the world and salt of the earth, that it's true, and he gives us a great big job to step into. And then thirdly and finally, I want to remind you, Jesus did not speak about how we begin as disciples. You don't become a disciple by being shiny enough or salty enough. Jesus said, okay, now you're salty enough, now you're my disciple. Now you're shiny enough, now you're my disciple. No, no, no. The salt and the shine come once you are his disciple. And how do you become a disciple of Jesus Christ? How do you become someone that he would consider one of his followers? By repentance and faith. Repentance means to turn your back on sin and self and to direct your life towards Jesus. And faith means to put your trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, especially the work that he did on the cross, to be the substitute of the payment of sin that you and I deserved. That's what it means to repent and believe. So please remember, Jesus isn't telling us here how to become disciples, but rather how to live out once we are disciples. And I just feel that in the closing prayer that I'm gonna do in just a moment, I'm gonna give an invitation for anybody here who may not yet be a disciple. I mean, in a sense, I would think it would be wonderful if you all already are. But but what if somebody's here and and you're you're a churchgoer, but you're not really a disciple. You're a guest here. You're not really a disciple. You, You just wandered in here and you don't really know why you're here. Well, it's for this very purpose. So that you could right now today say, today is my day to say, I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you that opportunity in just a moment. Uh, Let's pray together. And uh, in the midst of the prayer, I'm going to give just that invitation. Father in heaven, what Jesus said here, Lord, it's not confusing. It's just really hard to live out. And so Jesus, I pray that you would free us from a sense of condemnation, but that you would give us deep within an abiding sense that you have called us to fulfill this role of being salt and light in this world. I pray, Lord, for every uh, dimmer switch disciple in our midst, that you would speak to their heart and just have them let their light so shine. Jesus, I pray that um, that we would cast off the fear of man in doing this, even though we may get pushed back. And most pointedly, Lord, I I pray uh, for anyone here who especially you're speaking to them today about letting their light shine brightly in their own house. Help them to do that, Lord. And Father, speak now uh, to any who need to become your disciples. Speak now to them, Lord, in the name of Jesus.